Episodes 10 and 11, The Shredder Strikes. The waiting is over. The Shredder is here. Well, we now know that Orokusaki is the Shredder. And all of the episodes up to this point have been leading to this. And finally, he reveals his true self. And it's pretty scary. There's much we don't know about the history of the Shredder at this point. But what we do know is that he's a very powerful, very skilled, very intimidating, very scary individual. Ah, none of you will leave here alive. I think it's somewhat distressing to the other three turtles when Leo goes off on his own, and especially when he goes off to talk to Saki, because they view him, and rightly so, as sort of their rudder, their linchpin. And it is kind of weird to see him going off and possibly going down a wrong path by, uh, at the very least, meeting with Saki and, and possibly joining up with him. We have been fighting each other when we should actually be on the same side, fighting against our true enemy. Leo probably would not have gone to a meeting with Saki if he had not been upset, and he would certainly have taken his brothers with him. Part of the reason that Leo is almost taken in by what Saki says is that Saki has blended just the right amount of truth into his lies, which is always a dangerous thing, and it almost brings Leo to the point of believing him, but not quite. Tell your boss the answer is no. Ah! Leo is able to defeat Hun at the end of that episode uh, simply because he's able to summon up enough strength at that moment and enough of his skill to overcome Hun's great bulk and power. And he does feel guilty about getting everybody into this mess and getting their shells waxed. Man, I am such an idiot. I could have told you that. You know, you might think that uh, having a water tower dropped on top of you, especially after falling off the edge of a building, would pretty much do you in. You wouldn't be coming back. But as we see from the end of this episode, that doesn't happen with the Shredder. From the very beginning, when Kevin Eastman and I started doing the Turtle comic way back in 1984, we always felt that the Turtles coexisted with a lot of other strange things. And included in that set of strange things were superheroes. We, we just always kind of assumed that there were superheroes. And in fact, in later issues of the comics, we introduced other superheroes, superhero characters. It makes total sense to me. I mean, the turtles are pretty far out. And if you buy the turtles, you should be able to buy superheroes with no problem. They're a lot of fun. I, I love superheroes you know, when done properly. There are significant differences between the classic superhero and, and the turtles. First of all, the turtles, unless you count their mutation from little pet shop turtles as a superpower, they have no superpowers. But a, an even more distinct difference is that unlike the classic superhero, like a Spider-Man or a Superman, the turtles don't go out on patrol, so to speak, uh, looking for problems to solve or wrongs to right or crimes to stop. They occasionally you know, encounter those situations and they do the right thing, but they don't go looking for it. They're not the neighborhood watch. Never fear! Turtle Titan is... Ooh. Ow! The Silver Sentry is almost a, a, an iconic type of superhero. He flies, he has unique vision properties, and he's super strong. One of the reasons we created this kind of character is that it was, seemed like a really good icon for Mike, Michelangelo, to identify with and relate to uh, in his desire to be, quote unquote, a superhero. Sorry, this is a first for me. First time flying? First superhero team up. I think one of the reasons that Michelangelo has this attitude or approach is that of all four turtles, He's the most fascinated by the human world. And if he could, he would spend a lot more time with them. And he just thinks it's, it looks like so much fun to be part of that world. This looks like a job for Turtle Titan! 